Welcome to Vineyard Boise. It's our vision to make the invisible God visible wherever He places us. We come together on Sundays to worship and fellowship corporately. But we know that church isn't just about Sunday. It's about a lifelong, day-to-day following of Christ with other believers. We invite you to join us, just as you are. If you'd like to support our ministry, visit vineyardboise.org and click the Give Online button. I want to introduce uh, what somebody that to you may be a guest speaker. Uh, to me, she's a dear part of our leadership team. Uh, but, if, but she doesn't have a highly visible role on Sunday. So you, if you're new here, you may not know, um, you may not know her. But I'm going to ask Janet and Grayo to come. And as Janet's... As she's getting situated here, let me just tell you a little bit about Janet. Uh, Janet and her husband, Joe have been a part of our church, part of our leadership team, part of our staff, part of our family, uh, going all the way back to 91 is when they first joined us here at the Boise Vineyard. And, uh, and so they've been, they've been here through um, all of the seasons, through difficult times, through wonderful times, through times that were difficult, won- difficult and wonderful at the same time, wonderfully difficult. And, uh, and uh, I was thinking this morning before serve, first service, I was just praying during worship and saying, what could I what could I succinctly say that would just give you a glimpse of who Janet is? And it's this, that Joe and Janet throughout their lives um, have, have exemplified what, what uh, uh, the author Eugene Peterson said in his book title. He said, the Christian life is a long obedience in the same direction. So a long obedience in the same direction. And that's one thing I've seen in, in Joe and Janet and Grayo's lives. I've seen them continue to walk with God um, through difficult times, through valleys, over mountains. Um, they've continued to walk with God and trust Him. And in that, they've, um, they've grown in, in love, they've grown in Christ-likeness, and they've impacted many lives. Their fingerprints are all over this church. So I'm very grateful that Janet's here today. And so would you please welcome Pastor Janet and Grayo. Thank you. Just so you know, that long obedience in the same direction wasn't a straight path. (laughs) There was a lot of zigzag. Um, When Trevor asked me to teach this, he actually said, you know, you have life experience, which um, I have lots of life experience because I've been on this planet a long time. Uh, And the the, uh, passage today, we're we're in 1 Peter. This is chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, and the passage deals with marriage. And uh, I have a lot of life experience in marriage, too. I've been in several of them, uh, all with the same man. So just in case you were worried, um, I I have been in the honeymoon marriage, which was like two kids who did not have a good model of marriage. Neither one of us came from uh, a good model of marriage. Both of our dads uh, were unfaithful to our moms, and we were really young, unsaved. uh, But you know what? We knew it all. And it was going to be, he had the white horse and I had the pedestal. And so, you know, it was going to just be just like this. We were just going to go forever and it was going to be wonderful. But, you know, uh, he fell off the horse and the pedestal broke. And uh, pretty much we had to come down to real life. And then we were in the marriage that is the working marriage where uh, both of us were working hard. We were financially struggling. We were raising two kids. We were trying to figure out how do you balance all of that? How do you balance work and home and parenting and, and, um, and the love and romance? Where did that actually go? Um, and then, um, you know, T.D. Jake says that marriage is, the problem with marriage is, is that it's for two adults. And most of the time, there are two kids. You know, um, physical age doesn't necessarily correlate with emotional maturity. And the truth is that both of us needed um, emotional maturity and we needed spiritual maturity because uh, we were a mess and it ended up in, um, then we had the broken marriage. And uh, it was very broken. And we weren't sure that it was gonna survive. I actually wasn't sure I wanted it to survive. Um, But I'm here to tell you that uh, it did more than survive. It's thriving. And um, I am in my last marriage. I just want you to know this is the last one, and this is the um, rest- restored and victorious one. So God is good. We are going to celebrate 51 years of marriage in January. And yes, I was a baby when he married me. So uh, um, even though the passage does deal with marriage, uh, I know there are lots of people in the audience and online maybe that are not married, 
And, um, but I, I want you don't check out. I think that you'll find that there are principles that, were, that uh, apply to all marriages. And so I actually sort of titled this um, a, a, according to uh, a phrase that I heard a pastor use years ago. And he said, the kingdom of God is the kingdom of right relationships. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of right relationships. Right relationship vertically creates right relationship horizontally. Right? So that's what the title is. We've got a kingdom of God uh, um, of right relationships. So uh, I do want to set a little context. I hope you've been um, here for the messages in First Peter. Um, if not, go online and, and listen to those. And I hope you're following Pastor Mike's devotions because he's, he does a great, great job. He did a fabulous job this week with this group of uh, scriptures. Um, yes, yay, Ma Pastor Mike. But, um, you know, you see the word behind me, exiles, that is, uh, Peter addresses um, his audience as exiles in a foreign land. Um, these are uh, believers, these are Gentile believers. This is some 30 years or so after the death and resurrection of Christ. And so the gospel has spread, and these are believers who are living in the Roman provinces under Roman rule and in a Roman culture. They're Gentile believers, um, and it is not uh, a comfortable culture to be in for Christians. They are under persecution. Torture, suffering is part of the deal. And um, Peter is writing to them to encourage them. And uh, last week, Pastor Trevor took us through chapter 2, and he's, he started this whole theme of submission. Oh, I did not like that word when I first came into the church. But uh, he started this whole theme of submission to authority. And he started with um, the governing institutions, that they were to submit to those who were in authority over them in government. And then he progressed to the slave-master relationship and, and encouraged his, uh, these believers to um, submit to the authority of, slaves, uh, of their masters, even uh, um, the unjust ones, and that they were to, to um, show respect to them and that they were to display um, their faith in a way that... Um, would be winsome. And so then uh, in chapter 3 now, he moves a, even a little closer into the marriage relationship and, um, and uh, talks about that. So let's, let's go and we'll read the passage. So 1 Peter 3, 1. Likewise, wives, be sub subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. So, um, like I said, when I first got saved, I pretty much hated everything in there. Like, I, I didn't... I didn't like much of that. So um, it's an interesting thing that here I am teaching these scriptures, and, and now I can, I'm okay with this. So let's set context again. Um, uh, in Rome, marriage uh, looked very different than our marriages. So when we're listening to what Peter is telling these wives and how they are to conduct themselves, um, their marriage uh, relationships were very different than uh, what we have today. So marriage then and now, in, in Rome, it was all business. This was a social contract. Um, it was uh, very different from how we, um, we fall in love. We have love and romance as the basis for our marriages. Uh, this was uh, a top-down, male-dominated culture, and the husband and the father were making all these decisions, um, and where we have the individual chooses who they marry. This was not the case. Th these were arranged. They were arranged by the father and the groom, and these men would get together, and they, they got to actually decide who retained control over the woman. 
the father or the groom. And um, so they figured that all out. Uh, it wasn't going to be her. Um, again, the, there was a purpose to this, and that was to produce an heir. This was a social contract. It was a business uh, deal so that an heir would be produced. And in our marriages, certainly, we often have the goal of a family, but we want to share life together. It's a shared experience, and, and we want to share life together. Um, the husband and the father, like I said, they arranged this, and if the woman brought assets into the marriage, they actually decided who was going to retain the, the um, control of her assets. Uh, in ours, you know, generally, we pool our assets when we get married. Now, I want you to know Joe and I had zero assets to pool. We just had debt when we got married. But um, in our day-to-day, -day, a woman who brings assets in, we pool it, or if, if she wanted to, uh, or if the husband wanted to, they could keep their assets separate. You know, we have these things called prenup, prenup agreements and that kind of thing. So marriage looked very, very different from ours. So let's go back to the text. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Again, this was a male-dominated culture, and what was going on here was um, if, if a man came into the church, then his wife would automatically come into the church and his children and possibly his whole household. But what was happening here were women were coming to Christ independently of their husbands. And they were hearing the message of freedom in Christ, and they were wanting to share that message. And um, Peter is saying, you, you know, uh, don't come out from underneath your husband's authority. A, um, it could be unsafe for them. But he's saying, um, you know, uh, you're not going to win your husband by nagging or harassing or, or by a bunch of words. Let your conduct show your relationship with Christ. As you are kind and respectful and that kind of thing, that has more uh, a chance to achieve the goal of winning him to Christ. So in our, my personal experience, this was the opposite for Joe and I, because Joe is the one who um, accepted the Lord, and I didn't want anything to do with that, actually. I'd been um, uh, raised in a, um, uh, uh, I'd been allowed to go to a traditional Sunday school, but I had never heard a message of salvation in Christ. I'd never heard of surrendering or anything like that. I viewed God very much um, like I viewed my own dad, which was, um, he was emotionally distant, very perfectionistic, and um, busy off taking care of other people, which I thought God was probably taking care of the world, people who needed it far more than I did, um, because I was taking care of myself. And I thought that's what God really wanted me to be, was independent and strong, and, and um, just I, I didn't know how to ask for help, or uh, I definitely didn't want to be the one who made all the mistakes. So um, I thought that I was a Christian because I wasn't Muslim or Jewish. And that, therefore, I was a Christian, right? And so this message that Joe's aunt, who'd gotten saved in the Catholic renewal of the, uh, you know, of the Holy Spirit, she'd led Joe to Christ behind my back. Um, this message of surrender and um, Jesus, you know, being in control of your life, yeah, like, I didn't want anything to do with that. So, uh, but the thing is that Auntie and Joe, Joe especially, he never shamed me. He didn't force me. He didn't guilt me. He didn't nag me about not believing the way he did. He and Auntie just continued to enjoy Jesus and learn about Jesus and pursue Jesus, and they gave me time and space to let the Holy Spirit do what his job was, which was to draw me and to show me that I had a need for Christ. And, you know, the truth is we can't change anybody and we can't save anybody. That is the Holy Spirit's job. And the best thing we can do is I know that they were praying for me behind my back. Um, the, uh, the best thing we can do is give them space, love them, love Jesus, and let God do what he can do, only he can do. So, um, but now if we come forward and we look at marriage today and we say, well, this is a hard thing that we're being asked to do as a woman to um, submit to the authority of a husband who is not following God, um, that's a difficult thing. You know, relationships can be very messy, right? Uh, and, I, I, and I just want to make sure that everybody understands we are not talking about 
uh, anyone, a woman or anyone else, being asked to submit to an authority that asks them to do something immoral, illegal, that violates their conscience, that violates their, um, their, what the word of God says. That's not the kind of submission we're talking about. That should never be allowed, right? So we're not talking about that, but we're talking about just life decisions, you know, besides the thermostat wars, you know, <laughs> which may go on in your house. Um, that we're talking about, you know, do we buy a new car? How do we parent? Um, all of that kind of thing where sometimes you're gonna be on the opposite side of, um, of a decision, but the kingdom of God is the kingdom of right relationships. And so the most important relationship that we have to take care of is this one first. So um, Colossians 1, 13 to 14 says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. This is who we are as kingdom people. We have been removed, rescued, one of the translations says, and transferred into the kingdom of the Son. And in the kingdom of the Son, who's the king? King Jesus, right? We serve King Jesus. And so, um, you know, this is an upside down kingdom. This isn't a kingdom of dominance and force and that kind of thing. It's, it's a, a kingdom where Jesus led by power and humility, right? Power was found in humility and compassion. My mom used to tell a story about a little four-year-old who was standing at the kitchen uh, table, and she was standing on her chair. And, and the mom was saying, you need to sit down. And she said, no. And she said, you need to sit down and sit down now. And she said, mm, no. Well, the mom made it clear to her that the consequences were going to be really negative if she didn't sit down. She needed to sit down. So she sat down. But she said to her mom, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> and I have to confess that there were, have been plenty of times in my life where that was the posture of my heart. That is not the posture of the heart that we want to have, right? We don't want to have to obey because we're under somebody's thumb and, and there's force and there's that kind of thing, guilt or obligation. We want to, because we've been liberated from the law of sin and death. We want to choose to obey out of gratitude and love for our Savior, right? Um, and Jesus is our example, so let's see how he did it. Uh, I took this from the message because I really like the way it says it. Uh, this is from John 15, and, and Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's about to go to the cross, and he says, I've loved you the way my Father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done, kept my father's commands and made myself at home in his love. You know, think about that. Isn't that amazing to know that we are loved with the same love that the father has for Jesus? That's the same love that the father and Jesus love us. And, and um, that he's saying, you know, make make my love the home for your heart. Make the fact that you are loved, make that the safe place for your heart. Come and live there, come and dwell there. Um, and then he, he, adds, he adds that, he says, um, I've told you these things for a purpose. There's a purpose. Um, even in that, keeping God's commands and, and recognizing that we're loved. And that is to, to have joy. He says, my joy might be your joy and your joy would be complete, fully mature. So um, obedience, I'm telling you, obedience for me at the beginning, there was no joy. I didn't see joy in obedience. It was hard for me because I had control issues. I had fear and I, uh, I had pride and I thought um, I needed to be responsible, make sure that everything was going the right way. And, um, but, but I came to learn that the one who has the authority and makes the decisions, has responsibility for the outcomes of those decisions. And sometimes if I forced my way, and people had to do it my way, and it didn't go so well, guess who they were looking at? Right? Me. Um, when I think of coming under God's authority, I think of a, an a umbrella of protection from the storm. And there's this, you know, hail going on, and I stand under my umbrella. And if I stay under the authority of God, I stay under his sovereign care. Um, it's okay for me 
to be honest about the fact that I don't like it, that I'm frustrated or I'm afraid or I'm concerned, whatever that is, I can be honest with him because, what did we say? I'm fully loved and I'm safe in his love. And he knows it anyway. I'm not hiding anything from him. Hello, he's God. He knows what's going on inside of me and he knows what my fear is. And so I know that if I step out from underneath that and I try to do things in my own will and I take control again, I step out from underneath that umbrella and guess where the hailstones are? I'm, I'm, I'm not protected anymore. So staying under that, if I do my part in submitting to God and listening to him and doing it his way, then he is responsible for the outcomes. And when it came to the conversations and the difficulties in my marriage, the, you know, it was difficult sometimes for me to submit to my husband, but if, if he would offer me the respect to listen and value my opinions and my perspective, and then I could make him responsible, he was responsible for the outcome of the decision. I was still protected. And if I couldn't trust him, I still could trust the higher authority of God who loves me, knows me, and, and has my best. So, um, Let's go on. I'm going to read through the rest of these scriptures, and then we'll sort of unpack them a little bit. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing that you wear. But let your adorning of the hidden person of the heart be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Mm, do not fear anything that is frightening. That's an interesting message, right? So here he's saying, uh, apparently the women of that day were not immune to the messages of their uh, day about trending fashions being uh, what makes them beautiful and what makes them acceptable. And our culture does the same thing to us, doesn't it? We have messages given in our culture about what all the externals that make us beautiful and acceptable and um, worth and value. And you know what? The culture is a liar. Because our worth and value does not come, ladies, from how we look and dress. Our worth and value does not increase as our weight decreases. That's not, there's no correlation to that because our identity is in Christ. Our identity is in who God says we are. And he says, you're my masterpiece. He says, you're my work of art. He said, I made you, and I love you, and I created you the way I want to create you. Now, don't get me wrong. Health is important. We need to steward our bodies. We need to have health, and we need to have exercise and good nutrition and that kind of thing. But that cannot be where we take our identity of, of being acceptable and having our worth and value. Because we're his daughters. Ephesians 2.10, you are my masterpiece. I created you not only the way you are, but I also created you with purpose. Your life has purpose, and I've already ordained the things for you to walk in. And I'll equip you and gift you to do that. Um, that's where we want to take our, our worth and value from. And, you know, women, we need to champion this message. Men, you need to champion this message with us. Because men are not immune to what the culture says either about what, make you, what makes you acceptable and what makes you have worth and value. You know, your worth and value is not about how much you can bench press or what your title is at work or how successful you are or, um, uh, you know, how you did on the football field last night. Because I'm sure there's some guys in blue and orange today who are struggling with their worth and value because Ooh. the game didn't go so well. Like, Brett Rippon, we forgive you and we love you. <laughs> Right? That's not where you get your worth and value, except to the NFL. But the, um, your worth and value, uh, you know, it doesn't come from the external. And that's Peter's point, is that our worth and value comes from who we are. We are image bearers. We are made in his image. And we are priceless and precious. So let's talk about the gentle and quiet spirit. Well, for me, when I first uh, came into the church and first got saved and read these, like I said, I didn't like any of this because I was never quiet. I was always the one who got in trouble um, for talking too much in school. I'm, I'm kind of an extrovert. You might have picked that up. But um, uh, 
This isn't talking about personality. I thought I had to change my personality, and certainly there were things about my character that needed to change and make me um, more attractive to others. But um, uh, this is talking about what's going on in the inside. And, and so, uh, you know, we have a book that our leadership team, our pastoral leadership team has been studying here. You've heard it, The Canoeing the Mountains. And in that, Todd Bolsinger talks about red zone, blue zone, and he relates this to emotions. So when your emotions are in the red zone, you're fired up, right? You're, you're maybe angry or anxious. There's frustration. There's all this stirred up. And in those kinds of situations, we make impulsive, um, we react, we make impulsive and compulsive decisions, and we are not at our best. In the blue zone, we're calm, we can, um, we can hear other perspectives, we can be logical, we can find the best solution, we can be kind, and we can respond instead of being so reactionary. Well, it's the same, I, I use the same kind of analogy for my spirit because when my emotions were stirred up, my spirit was stirred up. And I, I had sleepless nights, and I worried about the future, and I had anxiety, and I was trying to, to do all these things to, to fix the solutions, to find the solutions. And I was do, 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 and I was working, 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 um, all in my own strength. And, um, but the blue zone, the gentle and quiet spirit, when I can take the time to recognize that that is not effective, that um, when I take the moment and I stop and I take a deep breath, I breathe, and I quiet my mind, and I quiet my heart, and I quiet my spirit, and I wait on God, when I can be in that place, then I can hear his voice, and I can hear what I need to hear in the moment. I may need reassurance if I'm afraid. I may need comfort if I'm hurting. I may need healing. I may need forgiveness. I may need wisdom and direction. But in that place, when I can just be, rest from the striving, rest from the doing, not be the one with the solution, but just be in his presence, I can hear his voice and I can respond in a way that's far more effective. I want you to know this was absolutely not natural to me. It took time, and it took discipline, and I didn't do it well. But now, I'm going to tell you, this is my favorite place to be. And I live there. I love to be in that place where it's safe. So Peter also says um, that that's far more attractive than anything that culture is selling, right? Um, and that others have actually done this and survived. And he points to Sarah, which and Abraham and Sarah is an interesting choice for marriage uh, because if you would look at that, that isn't like the model marriage you'd want to pick, I don't think. Um, just a, a snippet, Abraham, uh, Sarah was beautiful, there's a famine in the land, they go down to, Pharaoh, to Egypt, and, and Pharaoh has a harem, and it's obvious that they're going to want uh, uh, Sarah in the harem. And this can go one of two ways. Uh, he can say that he is uh, her husband, and they'll kill him, and Sarah will go into the harem. Or um, he can say that she's his sister, and unfortunately, she will still go into the harem. But he will stay alive, and maybe that would give God time to work, which is exactly what happened. And as it turns out, God works it all for their good. He returns Sarah to her. He says, here's your wife. You take your wife, and then he gives her he gives them camels and donkeys and all kinds of things, and they leave better off than they started. I'm not... A, 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 you know, no one's going to advise this as a great decision that Abraham made, but my point is, Abraham and Sarah's relationship, if you look at that, I mean, Abraham made some great decisions, and he made some not-so-great decisions. Joe and I, Joe made good decisions and not so great. I made some terrible decisions and manipulated and controlled, and I made some good decisions. Marriage, relationships are messy. Marriage is a little bit messy, but if we can... Um, get our relationships right, vertically with God, horizontally with each other, it, God can work it out for good. And he reminds, uh, Peter reminds the women, these Gentile Christians didn't have a long legacy of faith. They didn't have a lot of mentors to, to call on. There hadn't been, um, they were Gentiles. They hadn't belonged to the Jewish nation. So he brings that in and he reminds them, listen, women have done this before. Um, uh, and, and you can be like this, these women in the Jewish nation, in the nation of God. This is your heritage of faith. And you can follow in their footsteps. And these women hoped in God. 
they trusted in God to either correct what needed to be corrected or redeem the situation for their good. And we also can do the same thing and leave a legacy of faith. And now Peter does have a word for husbands. Yay! Um, and now he's talking to believing husbands, right? So he says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Um, so my husband would be the first one to tell you that for a man to uh, live in an understanding way, meaning in, in this way, understanding the way a woman's head works, mind works, it really needs to be empowered by the Holy Spirit because we see things very differently, we process very differently, we feel very differently, we express it very differently. Joe and I are extremely different individuals. Um, it takes empowerment by the Holy Spirit. But here, he's actually saying, you know, be kind, be tender, because uh, he says she's the weaker vessel. So, um, <laughs> let's talk about that. I gave birth naturally. <laughs> Any of you men want to top that? <laughs> yeah. Um, although I don't have a big, strong stature, he, you know, uh, he is not talking about the woman's moral strength or her intellectual strength or her spiritual strength or her value. He's talking about the fact that, in general, we are of smaller stature and that they should treat, men should treat their wives with tenderness and um, be kind. So um, remember that in this world, women were disadvantaged. Uh, without the protection of a man, they were vulnerable to attack, to abuse, to poverty. And unfortunately, in our world today, that hasn't been eradicated in every country. That's still the case in, co in countries across this world. Um, in the Western world, where we live here, women certainly are much better off. But uh, the inequality is still there. Uh, and the single moms and their children are still the most disadvantaged members of our society. And they are still vulnerable to abuse and to poverty. As you heard, I've been part of Celebrate Recovery for almost 15 years now. We're having our 15th anniversary this next week, which is pretty amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, we hear stories of abuse uh, over and over and over. Uh, unfortunately, we can't turn on the news without hearing stories of abuse. The Me Too movement is a strong symptom that there's something wrong, that the enemy has hijacked the gift of human sexuality. And uh, it needs to be turned around. So, um, you know, uh, Peter says to the husbands that God cares very deeply. It, it matters to God about how men treat their wives and women in general. Um, and, and he says that there are consequences, actually, for mistreating your wives, which he says your, uh, your prayers would become, the, the husband's prayers would become unfruitful and um, uh, un ineffective and stunted. So that's, that's an interesting thing to stop and say, you know, sila, like the, the word does. Stop and think about that. The next time men, your buddy says, man, I just don't feel like God's listening to me. I don't think my prayers are going anywhere. You might ask him, how's your relationship with your wife? You know, how are you doing there? Because the word says it matters. It really matters. You know, he says that, that we're to be honored as co-heirs of the grace, the gift of life, and the grace of life. In the garden, you know, Adam and Eve were on equal footing with each other and with God. The word says that they were naked and unashamed. There wasn't anything that they had to hide from each other. There wasn't shaming or blaming. There wasn't guilting. There wasn't like, who had the worst day so that you know, somebody was gonna cook the eggplant? Um, you know, they didn't have to play that kind of game because they were completely at, at home with one another and they were at home with their creator. God used to come down and just kind of hang out with them, right? The struggle that mankind has for control with God and the struggle um, that uh, comes with power and control between men and women, that is a, is a result of the fall. That is not God's creation. That is not the way he created it to be. 
You know, when we first came to the vineyard years ago, Pastor Try and Nancy were, um, Nancy Robinson were pastoring the church, and the only pastor's wife I'd ever seen was, um, uh, all the pastor's wives I'd ever seen either uh, played the piano, worked in children's ministries, or could lead Bible studies for women. That was it. That was what they did. And Nancy wasn't doing any of that. There were other, there were other people doing that. And, they, you know, she'd empowered the people who had that gift and to do that. But Nancy wasn't doing any of that. Nancy knew, she knew who she was in Christ. She had a strong identity in Christ. And she knew how she'd been created. She knew what her gifts and talents were. She knew how they were to be used for the benefit of her husband and for the growth of the church. And she always in, it just encouraged me to be the best version of myself that I could be and, and let God show me how he'd created me and where I could serve or where I could lead. You know, Nancy just resisted um, that traditional kind of pigeonhole of what a woman in the church could be. And uh, I've always been blessed to be part of a church that affirms women and empowers them to lead and serve in a way that God designs. Um, yeah, this is a good place to be. So he calls us to homes of honor, homes of honor, where we would actually have mutual submission and respect. As Paul kind of echoes that, and he makes it uh, a little bit, he fleshes it out in Ephesians 5, he says, um, submit to one another out of your reverence for Christ. Women, respect your husbands. Men, love your wives sacrificially. You know, that will be kingdom relationships. And then he says, uh, 1 Peter 3, 8, he finishes it, and he says, finally, all of you, husbands, wives, men, women, brothers, sisters, parents, all of you um, have, one, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. And, you know, my older NIV, it's interesting, my older NIV is different than the newer one, but my older NIV says, finally, all of you, Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. You know, I love the word harmony there because we don't all have to sing in unison to be in unity. We don't all have to be cloned and think the same and see it the, the same way. We don't all have to sing the same tune. Actually, harmony is where we all sing our own tune, a different tune, but it blends and it complements. It doesn't compete. We don't drown each other out. We don't sing off key. We don't sing the, a, a, a completely different song. And the harmony actually, it, it enhances the, the melody. It makes it more beautiful. And that's, I, I think that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to, to actually see our unbelieving spouses or our unbelieving friends or our family members, those kind of people. We want to see them the way God sees them. They are also made in his image. They are image bearers. They are deeply loved by him. And as, as Pastor uh, Trevor introduced us to the, to the little phrase a couple of weeks ago, we are objects of grace, right? None of us came into the kingdom because of our good looks and our exceptional smarts, right? Um, we are all a work in progress. And as we are objects of grace, we can be agents of grace. So um, the last thing is, there's a purpose to our tables. Don't try to do this alone. Uh, when Joe and I were in crisis, we were in a place where we were accepted, we were forgiven, we were loved, we were encouraged, there was hope. There were people who came around us. There were people who loved us, and they had faith for us. And that's why there are tables here, so that you don't have to be alone. And you don't have to go through anything that you're going through alone. You can be connected, you can be known, and there can be family around you and community around you to help restore you. So um, I'm um, gonna invite the band back up. I think they're coming. I think the band is coming. Oh yeah, he's right there. And uh, we do have a little point of application around your tables. If you would, um, somebody at your table, reach in uh, to the box there. There's a little candle and a little lighter. And uh, would one of you take it out and light it, please? Go ahead and light it, and I'm going to light mine.
So we're just going to take a moment. There's a practice that Pastor Amber Gunstream has brought to us. Uh, on Tuesday mornings, we have staff worship and prayer. The whole church is invited, by the way. We meet in auditorium um, too, and it's a, a, a really beautiful time. It's like, you know how great you sound when you sing in the shower? You know, we're all gathered in auditorium too. We just sound so great. Um, but we worship together, and, and Pastor Amber's brought in the practice of bringing a candle in and lighting it as a visible reminder of the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is present. He's here. He is very, very engaged in what's going on in our lives. And so uh, we're going to take just a moment and just in your own um, private space, the, the band is going to play a little bit. And um, I'm just going to ask you to just uh, close your eyes and ask God to bring to mind um, a face or a person or a relationship that may be needing a touch, maybe needing a light, a little bit of light, maybe needing a touch from the Holy Spirit. It may actually be your relationship vertically that needs some hope rekindled. Uh, there, may be, um, uh, there may be healing necessary. There may be forgiveness necessary to be received or forgiven and reconciliation. There may be a little bit of hope that needs to be rekindled. So. Um, we're just going to give everyone a little bit of a space to just close your eyes, ask God to bring that relationship to your mind, and place the Holy Spirit in the middle of that relationship. You know, Joe and I have taken this practice and we've brought it home to our house. And uh, if we're in the middle of a difficult conversation, maybe we're on the opposite sides of something, or maybe we have a, a, an important decision to make, or one of us is hurting, we will light the candle and we will remind ourselves, we'll focus that the Holy Spirit is present. He's present in our relationship. He's present with whatever it is that we need at the moment. And so, um, you know, a living relationship with God is a growing relationship. Like I said, our long obedience in the right direction went like this. We're all a work in pro progress. But it can result in cooperative and respectful and loving relationships. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of right relationships, right vertically, right horizontally. And um, the last scripture says, Colossians 3.14, he says, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in harmony. 
So you could blow out your candle, and if you'd all stand, we can sing one more time with the, the band, and then Jesse will dismiss us. Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We say yes this morning. We say yes to, to the freedom that's raining down in this place. We say yes. We say yes to the showers of your mercy and grace, God. We say yes to your, to your voice leading us in right relationship. We say yes, God. Would you shape us? Would you make us more like you? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give it up for Janet? That was awesome. Thank you, Janet. Hey, if you need prayer this morning, um, find someone at your table if you want prayer, or you can come on up. I think our ministry team will be up here. Don't leave today uh, without getting prayer if you need that. And other than that, be blessed. Have a great day.